Hello dear student, welcome to another lecture in Tensor Analysis. In this lecture, we will be learning more on physics. So we will be looking into the kinematics in Riemannian space. In this video, we will be talking about how a free fall is defined in Riemannian space, what is actually a straight line and different conservation laws and also have to derive the Newton's laws of motion from a geodesic equation. Before I start, I would like to recall some of the points which we were uh, discussing in our previous lecture videos. Hope you remember what we discussed about manifold. A manifold is a topological surface that locally resembles a Euclidean space at each point. We define a globe as a two-dimensional manifold on a three-dimensional space. And this three-dimensional uh, space, the globe, when we look uh, from the, an aerial view, we can see the curvatures. But as we think, uh, when we think ourselves as a someone, a one dimensional or two dimensional being living inside that globe, living on the surface of the globe, we cannot feel the curvature. And these every space look locally as a Euclidean nonlinear space. This is the difference, major difference between the general relativity as well and the special relativity. When we are looking from above into the globe and uh, define the dynamics which is happening over the globe, then we are talking about general relativity. But if we consider ourselves as a being which is living on the surface of the globe, say we are an ant living on the surface of the globe and we define whatever seeing around us, then we are talking in terms of general relativity. So, a manifold uh, resembles a Euclidean space in nearby space. We have also defined about a geodesic. A geodesic is a curve representing the shortest path between two points on a Riemannian manifold. A geodesic on a plane is a line, on a sphere is a circle. It is a path which is taken by a non-accelerating body that is a body under a free fall in a Riemannian manifold will always take a path and that path is called a geodesic. We have also uh, talked about parallel transport in a, one of our previous lecture videos. A parallel transport, uh, a vector is said to be parallel transported if it is transported in such a way that its direction and all its components are kept constant. We, uh, let me define another term here that is a local Lorentz frame. As I have already said, there is a difference between general relativity and special relativity. A special relativity is a defined when we are living on that manifold and we cannot actually experience the curvature around us. So special relativity, uh, the space of the special relativity, that the Minkowski space, is the space in which we define special relativity. And the Lorentz frame is a frame from which we are observing. That is the normal Euclidean space with some of the curvature corrections. So local Lorentz frame refers to a coordinate system or frame of reference that is only expected to function over a small region or a restricted region in space or space-time. There are uh, small free-falling regions where the physics of the curved uh, space-time would not affect much. So, uh, local Lorentz frame, when we are talking about local Lorentz frame, think about that we are defining it as a being living on the surface and uh, moving along with the surface and we define only the things which is happening in and around us in that local region. Another term which I would like to introduce is a world line. A world line of an object is the path of an object that the object traces in a four dimensional space. That is the trajectory of the object. The world line uh, of a 
poly, uh, freely falling object is called a geodesic. Whatever path or trajectory a, a body follows in a four dimensional space is called a word line. If the path is under free fall, then the path taken, then the word line of that particular object is called a geodesic. There are different types of trajectories when we uh, talking uh, when in uh, general relativity we have to talk about different ty uh, types of trajectories that are time like light like and space like trajectories. Time like curves have each point having at each point the speed of light is equal to c. That is, uh, you see the picture over here. Here, uh, the con, uh, here the, you see a con which uh, divides the event into a future light con and a past light con. And this con actually defines the light-like trajectories. So, this divides the space-time into two different parts. The events in light-like curves can be connected by light rays. And we cannot actually define time or measure time in these light-like counts. In time-like curves, on the contrary, they are uh, the curves in which the speed is less than the speed of the light. And these uh, uh, curves falls in between those con region. The light-like uh, curves forms the con and the time-like curves are the points which is inside that con. And here we can measure the time, the actual time, a proper time, we can measure time. And the remaining, uh, the remaining space which is represented by the plane over there is called the space-like trajectories. And all our measurements such as uh, length or whatever which cannot be defined with light is uh, taking place in the space-like trajectories. Let me define another uh, term here that is the proper time. A proper time is uh, defined along a time-like trajectory in the word line and is defined as a time measured by the clock that follows that line. In a uh, proper time, the time interval between two different events does not depend only on the events but also on the word line which is connecting them. The measured time uh, by the proper time is the time measured by the observer and we cannot measure proper time on light like trajectories. We can measure proper time only in space like trajectories and in space uh, like trajectories it's always the same. The proper time or uh, actual time what we measure is always the same. But in uh, time like uh, trajectories we can find the difference in the proper time measured by the observer or another observer in another space. So this is the time measured by the observer who is living on that word line. Another uh, concept is four vector. You have already learned about, you might have learned about this in your general relativity course. I gather. A four vector is an object with four components, uh, which transform in a specific way under the uh, Lorentz transformation, if you're uh, talking about special relativity. And uh, this uh, four vector, actually a vector which having four components, there will be one time like component and three space like component. Uh, for example, if you are talking about position, uh, uh, the position four vector will be the position say x, y, z and also the time like component c, t. Similarly, we have a momentum four vector at uh, another four vectors also. So in four vector we will have three space like component and one time like component. Having said this let me move on to the portion. So in this uh, video we will be talking about uh, the Riemannian space. The kinematics which is happening in Riemannian space. When we talk about kinematics, we know we are talking about motion. 
So the very simplest motion which we can find or we can define is just a motion in straight line or the free fall. The fall, uh, the motion which doesn't involve any kind of forces, the body is simply uh, falling over. The free fall is the simplest motion which we can define. So let us consider a point mass in the local Lorentz frame. A point mass by here I mean that uh, the body contains only mass. It has no spatial extent. It has uh, no uh, charge or uh, anything interesting. It just has mass and it uh, just couples only with mass. So it is a point mass we have in a local Lorentz frame. So if that such a body is moving without coupling with any of the field or any of the forces, then the body will be in a uh, free fall. That is the body will be simply moving. It will be in a free fall. If a body is in a free fall, the trajectory it follows is what we call as an inertial trajectory. That is a trajectory which uh, depends only on its initial conditions and also uh, uh, some uh, quantity such as velocity which uh, defines its direction. So a simple inertial trajectory. We can uh, 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 write a mathematical form of a simple inertial trajectory by plotting its initial condition whatever may be its initial condition with some uh, uh, function which is a function of time. So something which added up as uh, the function as the time evolves. So it is the simple inertial trajectory now if we know that the simple line which we can define is a straight line if uh, we call it a straight line the simplest motion possible then we know that the straight line is a line in which it propagates along its tangent vector for example consider a body which is moving along a straight line then you can see that the tangent at this space uh, directs towards the, uh, this direction and the body also moving in the same direction. So if the body moves in the direction as its tangent it is, then it is called a, a free, uh, it is called a straight line motion. That is tangent at a time t1 and tangent at a time t1 plus delta t1 will be the same when it is happening under a local Lorentz frame. That is, we don't uh, need to go far to make curvature possible. Here it is happening in a normal Euclidean plane. So the tangent at a time t1 and a tangent at another time which is just passed by is the same. Then we call that the uh, motion is a straight line motion. The straight line motion, what actually doing it, it is parallel transporting its own tangent vector. We know what is parallel transporting. It is transporting a vector, keeping all its components and direct, uh, direction as constant. So a straight line trajectory is just parallel transporting its tangent vector. Now, let us quantify whatever we have said. Imagine a body which uh, has a trajectory which is parametrized uh, by a constant a parameter lambda. Uh, let this parameter lambda be a scalar quantity which accumulates uniformly as it moves along the world line. And the trajectory of this uh, uh, this uh, tangent or trajectory we have already seen its equation of motion it's uh, if it is uh, just an inertial body we have an initial condition plus uh, the tangent to the space uh, we have its initial condition plus its tangents to the space okay uh, which uh, moves as along its time so when we need to define the tangent we will just uh, take the derivative of that body with respect to whatever parameter we define. So we have to define tangent with respect to the parameter lambda. Then it will be just a differentiation with respect to lambda. So the differentiation with respect to lambda will give us a tangent u alpha. 
So here u alpha is dx alpha by d lambda. So we have said that we have uh, in uh, if the motion is a straight line motion, its tangent is parallel transported. If the tangent is parallel transported, the covariant derivative of the field when contracted with the tangent vector should give you zero. Let me uh, give you a more explanation. I have said that in a straight line motion, the tangent at this point and tangent at this point will be the same. If uh, they are the same, the dot product between this tangent vector and any uh, derivatives which happening around this vector, uh, any covariant derivative or any partial derivative which happening around this vector have to go to zero. So what we are doing is we take the covariant derivative of that field and we contract. Contract here I mean take a dot product uh, along its own tangent vector. Since they are parallelly transported, this will give me a zero. Here, uh, this uh, delta of alpha just means the covariant derivative. So, uh, you have we have already looked into the covariant derivative. Please uh, refer to lecture 5 for that. On expanding covariant derivative, we know that on expanding covariant derivative, we have a uh, uh, partial differential term and the term which contains the Christopher second order and we uh, contract it with u alpha. So this covariant derivative of the field u beta is contracted by u alpha and this should be equal to zero. But we know that here u alpha is nothing but dx alpha by d lambda. So when we just substitute dx alpha by d lambda, we can uh, just uh, cross out, cut out this x alpha term. And what we will get here is d by d lambda of u beta. And the Christopher symbol plus the other uh, tangent vectors along alpha and mu remains is equal to zero. Again, if I substitute for u beta from here as dx beta by d lambda and similarly for u alpha and u mu, I get back my geodesic equation. Hope you remember the geodesic equation. We have mentioned it in our previous video. So, we, I will get back my geodesic equation. See the format of my geodesic equation. This is a second order equation of motion. I have an acceleration term here multiplied with some constant into my uh, velocity term here which is equal to zero which is a simple equation of motion. This is equal to zero. Why? Because no force is acting upon it. We know that we usually write that force as uh, force is equal to some constant say mass into d square x by dt square. So a second order differential equation uh, which is equal to force. So if uh, since uh, he, he do not have any force our RHS goes to zero. This completely defined that this uh, motion is a free fall. Since we have considered it as a free fall the, uh, this uh, term will be equal to zero and what we get is a geodesic equation. So any trajectory which solves for this a geodesic equation is called a geodesic and, and this defines the motion due to uh, motion in uh, the Riemannian space. So in general case if we are in a presence of a field or we are in a presence of a force then we have to replace this zero with any properly constructed force. So the RHS changes if uh, we have, uh, if the body is in presence of any field. Say if the body is charged, then it will be in the, uh, it will be affected by the electromagnetic force in the local frame. So we have to uh, replace this RHS with uh, a properly constructed force. Similarly, 
if uh, we have considered an object as a point object right if we uh, say it has a spatial extent it has a finite volume then we have to consider how it couples with the local Lorentz frame uh, when we said it's a point object we imagine that it doesn't have any coupling with its background space if it does uh, have a finite mass it will be coupling with the background space time if it is coupling with the background space time when we then we will have additional terms of coupling in along this rhs side so if the body has a spatial extent then we will have coupling terms in the uh, lhs side if the body is under some kind of a force and then we will have some properly constructed forces in the rhs and then we will uh, solve for x beta in a properly uh, non uh, lambda and we will get the equation of motion of that particular body so this is how we get the kinematics in the Riemannian space so to get it, we need to know what are the constraints and what are the forces and uh, how the body looks and we will just solve for x beta. So far we have said a lot about lambda. Let me define lambda once. To define lambda mathematically, let me imagine a, a, re, a more general form in which the uh, vector and that is the motion is parallel transported the tangent vector is parallel transported uh, but its magnitude is allowed to expand or contract that is the direction is kept constant but its magnitude instead of keeping all its components constant i allow in its magnitude of the component uh, to ex uh, expand or contract such that the normalization of that vector changes then the combination of the tangent and the covariant derivative see this here i means uh, whatever we have uh, uh, written so far that is this is same as u alpha delta beta alpha so uh, this uh, this is same similar as here this uh, we, uh, this is another expression uh, which we can write uh, here expression I taken this expression because I have to define for lambda so this is another way in which I can write this that is u alpha contracted with the covariant derivative of the field so uh, this uh, instead of being equal to zero since I allow my parallel uh, transporting vector to change its magnitude it will be equal to some a linear uh, component of u alpha itself and the components are kept proportional in the tra uh, parallel transport with respect to some function which is kappa here the parameterization lambda star uh, lambda has changed to lambda star and this defines that uh, now uh, my whatever geodesic i'm deriving from it will have something in the rhs right so i can actually make uh, the geodesic which i am deriving to have nothing on the rhs that is rhs is, uh, can be made to zero just by relabeling what lambda is suppose we have uh, the parameter lambda such that it actually parallel transports that is uh, uh, its magnitude uh, remains constant and I defined my tangent vector V alpha here and uh, its uh, parallel transport such that it gives me equal to zero in the same space in the same local frame then my dummy parameter that was the lambda star and the lambda actually relates with each other with the equation d lambda by d lambda star will be equal to exponential of some function which is defined by kappa and lambda star so any body any test body can be written in terms of the geodesic equation 
provided uh, that uh, any uh, body can be written in terms of the geodesic equation and a parameter which allows me to get RHS is equal to zero is called an affine parameterization. Hope you remember about affine connection which we talked about in our fifth lecture when we were describing Christopher symbols. Please go to that lecture and see. So an affine parameterization is a parameterization which allows me to have this RHS equal to zero. So affine parameters such as lambda is, un is a parameter which is uniformly spaced in the word line. And the proper example for an affine parameter will be a proper time. The time measured by the observer in the same word line. So a proper time is an example for affine parameter. It is uniformly spaced in the word line. Affine parameter allows me to redefine itself such as if I need to uh, redefine lambda as lambda dash then I can do with as a linear combination of a lambda plus b. This just means that I have uh, taken another origin to define my time and uh, a means that I have choose, uh, chosen another unit to measure my time. Then also whatever measurement interval I measure will remain the same. So uh, this parameterization change, these changes is allowed and such parameters which allows changes are called affine parameter. They have to be uniformly spaced in the word line. So lambda, since we were talking about from the beginning of the lecture, this lambda is an affine parameter. On the notion of what we have discussed so far, let me ask you a question. What is straight? What is straight? We define straight from our concept of a very plain space. In a very plain space, straight line is something, something we actually conventionally define as straight. So straight a line should be that line which allows something to be transported in the shortest time period right so uh, when we define a straight we have we can define it in the terms of the freely falling body so if a straight line should be that line which is chosen by a freely falling body because a freely falling body will only choose a line which is uh, the shortest so straight line is the shortest line possible and is the uh, it is the path chosen by a freely falling body which couples only with gravity that is which has only mass and no other interesting phenomena such as spin or spatial extent or charge or anything. So it is the path which is chosen by a freely falling body. So consider two points, uh, say P and Q, two events P and Q, and I can define many time-like trajectories uh, which connecting P and Q. So a freely falling body, uh, we know that we define free fall as a uh, fall uh, body which has a no acceleration. So, uh, if a body is under free fall, it will choose a line, uh, choose a word line which has no acceleration. Here, many of the line may have acceleration and the line with no acceleration is the path of the free fall. We know that with acceleration, the aging decreases. So, in another word, I can say that the free fall path is the path in which the observer get aged most. That is, it is the path of the maximal aging. So, a straight line is a free fall path with no acceleration and it is the path of the maximal aging. So, uh, uh, we, uh, we, since we have uh, many uh, paths, uh, many word lines connecting the events P and Q, we have to find a word line in which the accumulated proper time is minimum. So let us define the accumulated proper time 
uh, when the observer move from uh, p to q that is when we uh, define lambda to be equal to zero at p and lambda is equal to lambda p at q and this lambda if an i find parameter so uh, i am easy to change its observation point and origin and uh, this proper time accumulated can be defined by this integral and this integral here we know that this is a metric tensor and these are velocities with respect to the parameter lambda and the coordinates along the coordinates alpha and beta and this uh, delta uh, tau that is the proper time accumulated when an observer move from p to q actually defines action we know we have learned in uh, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian dynamics that action defines the trajectory of a classical body. So this delta t actually defines action. So the action i is equal to half integral of the property which is here uh, with respect to d tau. We have learned uh, during our course in Hamiltonian dynamics that the, if a trajectory have to be stationary, that is trajectory is set to be stationary, if the action remains a constant, that is the, there is no variation in action, that is delta i is equal to zero. Here the variation can happen along uh, the coordinate x alpha or x beta such as it can turn to x alpha plus a delta x alpha or the variation can happen across the metric tensor that is the metric tensor can vary with respect to the alpha and by um, finding the variation we will come to uh, by substituting all this we will come to this expression over here. So, if we want our trajectories to be stationary, hope you remember we have defined the stationary trajectory. If you don't, I request you to go back to Lagrangian dynamics and have a look on variational principle. So, if the trajectory have to be stationary, yes, trajectory have to be stationary because uh, the path chosen by a classical body is a path in which the uh, action is stationary. Then, delta I have to be equal to 0. If delta I have to be equal to 0, the term over here happens to be have to be equal to 0. When you look into only these terms, you, this is a familiar equation and this is the equation for our geodesic. So, if it have to be equal to 0, this term over here should go to 0. This uh, metric tensor uh, we know that the first derivative of the metric tensor goes to zero. So it uh, can it, uh, actually work in and work out without um, uh, changing much changes inside the differential. So this can be eliminated. And here we come back to our geodesic equation. So geodesic actually defines a straight line. Again, I come back to my first point that is, a geodesic is the path followed by a freely falling body and that path is said to be straight. Whether it is straight in the conventional way or whether it is curved uh, or whether it's any path which is followed, that particular thing is called straight. Not a line which is drawn in a paper that is straight, any particular line which uh, has a no acceleration which has the maximal aging and in which a freely falling body actually moves is what is straight. So the geodesic gives us a notion of the straight line in a curved space and this is the trajectory of extremal aging. So a straight line can actually be a curved line. Now since we have uh, equation of motion and uh, we have action principle let us move on and define the constants of motion or constraints of motion we know that the constants actually tells us what is the trajectory of motion so let us define the constants of motion i am not here to define every constant but uh, some of the simple ones 
For example, we know that the linear momentum is always a constant of motion. So instead of u alpha in our previous equation, I would like to just uh, replace it by p alpha because I know that the linear momentum is mass times the linear velocity. And uh, my uh, parallel transport equation that is u alpha contracted with the covariant derivative of u beta can be uh, changed into p alpha contracted with the covariant derivative of p beta. And I can uh, just uh, expand the covariant derivative and uh, write like this. See, uh, since u is equal to em uh, mp, uh, uh, here I have 1 m and here I have 2 m, so 1 got cancelled. So this is a way in which I get it. So here I have, uh, I have taken with respect to delta t. And uh, see, uh, so far we have done all our uh, all our analysis in time-like trajectories. But we, what we are actually expecting is that uh, what we are actually uh, looking into uh, is uh, about light-like trajectories because we are more interested to know how light behaves in certain curved manifolds or. Uh, in the influence of uh, this uh, highly gravitating bodies or something. We now have to know the light behaves. So, uh, uh, instead of uh, sticking into those affine parameters which uh, define or a time-like trajectories, we can actually change those uh, parameters to something like a delta 2 which actually defines the light-like trajectories. So, here delta lambda is uh, uh, made equal to delta tau by m. Here delta tau and m both uh, change such that the delta lambda is cut constant. So here we have our equation and we can open up this uh, Christopher symbol of second kind using our metric tensors. We have defined it. And here you can see that we have our uh, symmetry between alpha and gamma. That is interchanging alpha and gamma doesn't make any difference here. So if alpha and gamma has a symmetry, then you can see that here these two terms goes to zero. Uh, when we look into the Christopher symbol of first kind, ex uh, expand it using that, we have done it. And the term which remains only is the first term. So, if there is a symmetry uh, and uh, alpha and gamma, we can define it as this. So, see what happens if this term, this particular term goes to zero. That is, in any particular coordinate system, we know that this term actually depends on uh, how the metric changes with respect to uh, any uh, coordinate q beta so uh, in any particular coordinate system which we choose uh, this metric vanishes with respect to any of the coordinate then we get this term is equal to zero or which implies that p beta is a constant in that geodesic sounds familiar yes we have done this in our uh, hamiltonian mechanics that is, if a, any coordinate goes to zero in any of the coordinate system we choose, then its corresponding momentum will be a constant of motion. Similarly, the same thing in any spacetime is independent of a particular coordinate x alpha, then we can show that p alpha is actually a constant of motion along the geodesic. And this brings us this relativity brings us uh, back to the classical motion in Hamilton this uh, constant of motion we can also define with help of a killings equation that is if we have a killing vector in the geometry of uh, that particular body itself then also we can show that uh, the p alpha goes to zero or uh, p alpha is conserved along the word line so there are two ways in which we can actually define constant of motion 
one is by saying that the uh, metric vanishes with respect to some uh, coordinate in a chosen field or uh, to say that that body if body has uh, some uh, vector called a killing vector let me add in here that this uh, killing vector or killings equation actually comes from the theory of groups the Lie algebra the Lie group hope you remember uh, you have done this uh, in your group theory actually the metric uh, analysis the tensor analysis and the group theory is something uh, more intertwined and which demands simultaneous reading whatever i have defi uh, defined so far in the uh, tensor analysis from the first video this can be uh, uh, talking in, uh, taken in terms of uh, uh, the group theory also so it ha uh, it is very intriguingly related with group theory also so this concept of killing uh, equation actually comes from the Lie algebra uh, just uh, wanted to put in this uh, because uh, I have to say that there is different ways in which actually we can extract the constants of motion from a geodesic equation. Uh, let me give you two examples here. The first example is the example which we have just said that is in a space time the coordinate uh, we have our time coordinate such that its a derivative of the metric goes to zero. Here, uh, this term just means that do by do t. It's a shorthand for do by do t. So do by do t of g alpha beta. That is with respect to time. Uh, the metric uh, when differentiated with respect to time goes to zero. So the uh, coordinate which is absent is actually the time coordinate. If uh, such an equation exists we know that there exists a killing vector that uh, that gives us that uh, the p actually goes to zero here p alpha or p t whatever it may be that is the momentum along the uh, time uh, component uh, time coordinate goes to uh, sorry it is a constant and that constant actually turns out to be negative of energy uh, doesn't bother about negative because negative um, um, because this p is written in the covariant form that's why we have a negative uh, symbol here uh, actually uh, we define this in asymptotically flat surfaces that is the surface which is far away from the uh, source of uh, gravity it's far away from a star or far away from anything that is uh, producing that field or anything that is making a curvature or distorting that field we are defining it far away from this such that the region here in which the local Lorentz frame in which we are defining actually happens to be flat so it is asymptotically flat since it is far away it is okay to define it as negative energy so energy here is the time like component let me uh, define actually this uh, negative energy content that is uh, uh, the uh, thing which is kept constant is the energy as uh, uh, goes good with many of the classical systems which we are familiar with so let me define another space time here which is described by ds square some function phi and t this is actually a very important space time i do not have much time and this uh, discussing this is out of the scope uh, so just uh, see that here we have a space time defined with this equation ds you know that actually uh, stands for the modulus of ds right okay so the phi uh, that is constant phi here the potential phi actually depends only on x y and z uh, and not it doesn't have any time dependence and the phi is taken to be very much less than one in slow motion that is uh, when the velocity is much uh, less than c uh, then the energy uh, is a time like component in our four momentum uh, uh, we have the four momentum, right? P alpha should be equal to Px, uh, Py, Pz plus that 
time lag component here the time lag component turns out to be energy and this time lag component is very much greater than the other piece over here in slow motion and which is almost equal to the mass of the object using this we can solve our geodesic equation uh, since the metric uh, tensor goes to zero for time like component and only uh, stands for uh, this uh, all the components we can uh, solve and get uh, contracted to this particular uh, here that is d by dt of pi is equal to minus of something does it look familiar differential of uh, momentum is equal to negative of gradient of some potential here i know that this is gradient sounds familiar yes we come back to uh, newton's equation of motion that is a uh, differential derivative of p the time derivative of momentum is equal to uh, negative uh, gradient of the potential so this actually yields us back to our newton's equation of motion and if this uh, phi turns out to be gravitational potential then this actually defines gravity the force gravity so uh, these are what i need to say in uh, kinematics in Riemannian manifold we have one more portion left uh, which we will try to cover up in this week itself uh, so these are my references uh, sorry to add over here uh, that i didn't actually find much references in the reference books uh, which is prescribed so i have to go to mit open courseware i also recommend you to go uh, to the link provided i may put it in the description box and uh, write uh, go through the materials provided it is very good and you will have a very great idea about what is happening so thank you and see you in the next lecture